actually more influential than the, the voice expression. Why that? Because the body language have uh, a not only the logical message, but the body expression gives also uh, under conscious expressions or information. What that means that everything what we hear pass through the analysis of the brain of the people. But everything what people see not necessarily pass through this analysis. This means that we can transmit information by body language that is uh, like, you know, like they used to say, uh, hidden messages that just enter in in the brain of people. They don't know why, but they have this, this, is, uh, this impression. Let's say uh, if we come very close to the people, if we come very close to the people and we make a gesticulation, the people get scared. And they draw back. They don't know why. It's an instinct of protection. If the brain is not yet, you know, conscious about that what's happened, but that's what happened. And also, there are other, other ways of gesticulation and, and body language that give messages to the brain and to the understanding. For example, if we raise up our hands like that, this is a message of embrace and uh, discovering yourself, which give a message of confidence. If we are like that, this is a message of close up. I have no confidence. I fear you. I am protected, and that reflects as a message in your mind, in your brain, and you are also protected. These are, this is just a very little of a, a big number of, uh, of way of expressions we can, we can use and transmit to our listeners. We cannot go in much details in the body language. This is, a, this is a course in itself. It's thick books that you can read about the body language. How to sit, how to drift, how to look the people. The <clears throat> that's all that is uh, in introduced in the body language. Let's see, it is very important where we, do we address our our eyes. If we look in the eyes of the people, this uh, transmit confidence. If we look somewhere else, I'm talking to you, but I'm looking somewhere else. It's it transmit the the message that I'm not so sure and I'm not honest, and that's what I say. So this is why it's very important that that we really. Uh, do the best we can in this direction, but uh, uh, it's important if we move from country to country or from place to place that we are informed about different customs of the local people. Because body language is different depending on culture. Let me give you an example. Let's say if you preach and you have your your hands in your pockets like that. If you're in Mexico, that will not, they will not take that seriously, okay? They will say, okay, he has this. Mexicans, they like to put their hands in their pockets. If you do that in Europe, this is a disaster because that means that you're very uneducated person, you don't know that you're not supposed to speak. It's a lack, lack of respect. It's 
effective function the pulse. So <coughs> this is uh, especially transmitting the message from the pulpit has this uh, tremendous influence. And the people can be very disturbed. After the sermon, they will come to you and they'll tell you, brother, please learn how to behave in the pulpit. This is lack of respect to the Lord and to the public and to everything. So this, are, this is just a small thing. <clears throat> Another thing that's very important is how we behave with the Bible as the word of God when we speak and how we behave or what we do with the pulpit. Because the pulpit in the eyes of the congregation is like the, the sanctuary. It's like the authority of the church. And we behind the pulpit will automatically become authority. This is why in many churches they say if it's not ordained minister, he has not the right to stay behind the pulpit. He has to stay Sabbath school lessons with somewhere else, doing somewhere else. Because coming behind the pulpit is almost like you're the high priest. You are already granted with a special authority. The way how we behave with the Bible and the way we, we behave with the pulpit transmit a message. And that is very important. What kind of expression we're going to use by ourselves. If we read the Bible in the front of the people, we need to be very careful how we behave with the book, how we open the pages, how we close the Bible. We can show respect and we, sh we can show lack of respect. I remember in one of the public meetings I did in Estonia, a lady came to me and says that she visited all public meetings that they were in Tallinn at that time. And she went first to a Pentecostal public meeting with an American lady that was preaching. And the way how she behaved with the Bible, or toward the Bible, disturbed her so much that she did not stay at that church. This lady was talking like that, doing like that to the Bible, screaming and shouting and cussing the Bible like that. And the people do not like that. It's against the culture, but also, no matter of the culture, if we are preachers of the gospel, if we're the people of the book, we need to show respect. We need to open with the respect of the book. In many places today, the Bible is no longer used for the, by the preachers in the front. They like to have projected their sermons in the front so that they don't look down, but that they always observe the public and just lift up their heads. It's more rhetorically, it's nicer. They, they also don't waste time of searching in the Bible and this and that. They can read the things in a in a monitor that's hanging there in the, over the public. But <coughs> that is about the Bible, to treat the Bible with the respect. Another thing is that we need to treat with respect is the pulpit. What happened many times is that when people speak and they got used to a minister that it kind of spent of his life preaching, for us, the pulpit is like, again, a kind of furniture. That's not the case of the people who come to church, especially the visitors. What happened many times is that the minister do like that. And that's a terrible expression. Why? Why? What, because this is a, a, this is a gesticulation or this is the expression that gives the message of tiredness, of boredom.
appalling uh, condition and that's transmitted to the people. If the minister who transmits the message is bored and tired, what do you expect of the people who sit in the chair? Well, they will slip down. And if they don't slip down, they will get the impression that the pastor that preached is not really touched with the message. It's not really, it doesn't matter for him the message. Now, how the person behaves is it's really interested on the things that he preached. What happened if somebody came and, and uh, he tells you that an accident has happened outside of the room? What is he doing? You know, he looks to you and he says, accident happened, accident. All his body, all his hands, all his face, everything is uh, put in to transmit you the message that something very important takes place. He's not saying like that, you know, accident happened, five people died, and, and my wife died, and my kids died, it was ridiculous. Mm -hmm. Nobody do that, right? And if somebody do that, they will say, this man is, forget it. He says, okay, I am liberated from my family. The thing is, um, that the most of the time, Things happen naturally and have to happen naturally. But unfortunately, the most of the time, Sister White says that an educated artist, a theater artist, is presenting a lie in a form of truth, and people believe him. And the minister that holds the truth is presenting in such a boring way, like a lie. People don't believe. So what we need to understand is we need to pay attention in our expression. I remember I was in one uh, seminar in one of our unions, and we have our ministers that are not so high in stage, and everybody has this big laptop, and they stay like that behind the laptop and preach, 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 reading, preach, preach, reading, hiding behind the pulpit. And then come another meeting about the women ministry, and then come the leader, and she was a powerful lady. I can tell you. And she come in the front, because she was not going behind the pulpit. She come to the front, and she was talking to people like that, and giving like that, and doing like that, and pulling like that. Then I call the ministers, tell them, look and learn. Look and learn. Don't hide behind the, the monitor because that is the most boring thing you can do. Go out to the people and share the importance of the message. At the same time, we cannot uh, use uh, expression in an exaggerated way. We cannot move too much, you know, moving here, moving there, preaching, because that makes the people nervous. So you need to have some, some moderate way of expression. But it is very important, brethren, that we express what we say, not only by volume, not only by words, but also with our bodies. It is, uh, we are tied here with our pulpit and with this TV things, the cameras are set up and you cannot move practically. You have to stay there and preach, translator and all the things. But I never do that when I go to a conference. That's the worst things you can do. You have to move. You have to, this is why you have a, area to move, you can also step down at the place, you can go to the public, you can talk to people, you have to look them in the face and showing in this way uh, confidence 
that you really believe what you're saying. Yes, brother, you need to say something. cannot handle that brother if you cannot preach you better don't preach but if you stay in the pulpit you cannot lean on the pulpit I know that many people are doing that and that is very bad sure. can you uh, at least like because you can preach but the thing is you have the words to say and you're not always doing it mean mm -hmm. but once in a while, but it, when you get tired, you just like try to like put your mute and then you do it. That is the thing, brother. If you get tired by preaching, transmitting the message, what do you expect of the people who listen to you? They, they will be three times tired. Okay. That is the matter. If you are not, if you're not interested in the message you transmit, much less the listeners will be interested. I think it's not more about you're not you have, you have problems in your knees. If you have problems in your knees, you need to announce that. Okay. You need to tell them, you know, I have problems with my knees. Okay. I'm going to sit for a while. Or I'm going to, to lean on, on that. But it's better to sit than to lean on the pulpit. Because the, if we lean on the pulpit, then it is like uh, disrespect to the to this authority as well, you know, we use that as a, it's a kind of usual things, you know. But if you get a chair and you sit nearby, that, that's not a big issue. Are you telling me these things like a universal thing or it's just the it, people coming to it is, it is a cultural thing. That means that Americans have one kind of body language. Which Europeans have another body language, and in Africans have another body language. Let's say it, here in America, if you see a child, it is a usual thing that you embrace the child and you, you know, put your hands on the head and so on. If you do that in Africa, that is a curse. If you take picture here, the people, that's natural things. If you do that to the Maasai, they will kill you because that means you take their souls out of their picture. It means taking their life and soul. It's a tremendous cultural thing. This is why I told you the first things you have to do is to have anthropological analysis. To whom do you preach? And what kind of things you can permit yourself and what kind you cannot permit yourself. George Bush, uh, George W. Bush, the President of the United States, go to Europe to official visit without doing any analysis. He came out of the airplane in the Czech Republic. The President stretched his hand for greeting and George W. Bush stretched his hand with a glass in and greets him. Terrible mistake. All the newspapers say this man has no education. He's a foolish cowboy from the United States. <laughs> yes, he doesn't know that he has to pull out his glass to greet another person. That is the French and the British education that's all over Africa, Asia, and Europe. It's a general recognized rules of education. And Americans don't care much because, you know, here that is the land of freedom, <laughs> but, <laughs> but this, <clears throat> this kind of things, you know, uh, can disturb the listener tremendously, tremendously. And uh, we don't want to put obstacles in our way. We want that the message go smooth to the person. This why also uh, Apostle Paul says, 
I don't want anything else except Jesus Christ the crucified. The most important thing is transmitting the message. All right? So this with the living and the pulpit, it's unfortunately a things that happen in many places in our church. And it is uh, it is ignorance, what to tell you, nothing else. Also, putting hands in their pocket like that, you know, it is a uh, lack of knowledge. People just, it is not important in, in South America, also in North America, it's normal sometimes big speakers do like that. It's a kind of message of relax. When you do that, it's like a message of relax. You are more, you know, like calm atmosphere. Right, but uh, I, I'm telling you, the European point of view, that is a tremendous mistake. Expressions of faith, expressions of words, and expressions of movements are very important. They can underline the main thoughts of the message, and they can destroy the influence of the message. What that means? This means that what we speak and what we do with body language need to harmonize together. Otherwise, if that is in contradiction, then we we have a, we have a very, very bad negative influence. What I mean? Let's say we speak about the the importance of sacrifice of Jesus Christ, how he suffered, how he was beaten, how he, and uh, how much he, pain he had in his body. And, and uh, the normal expression of our body in this moment is that we feel the suffering of Jesus Christ, that we express the suffering of Jesus Christ with our expression of faith with our hands, with our movement. But if I speak about the suffering of Jesus Christ, you know, Jesus suffered very much, you know, he was crucified, he had so much pain and this and that, and what happened? It's like, you know, I'm speaking about something that is not really very important to me. The logical reaction is, if that's not important to you, why shall that be important to me? Finish your instruments that you have in our sermon. Wow. So, what then we can do? We can have a, a if, if we are not sure in our expressions, we, we, can, we can stay in the place we are and try to explain the things we, we have to explain, but we shall not use, or we use not any gesticulation, not any movement and special expression, or if we use it, we need to use it properly. Otherwise, we can run in, in trouble. Movements, what kind of movements we can, we can use? We have to use movements in our hands. And we can move with our body, we can move to one place, we can move to another place. When we speak about heaven, you can show with your hands heaven. When you speak about earth, you can show about earth. When you speak about love, you can stretch your hands. When you speak about the cross, you can also stretch your hands like that. You can open yourself. This is very good gesticulation, transmitting confidence to the people. When you speak about Judah, or when you speak about the sin, you can close your hands. When you speak about prayer, you can do like that. All this is confirming the message of your voice and helping the people to understand what you mean and transmit more information, much more information than just the voice. The position of the body Ethics yeah, it's very important too. If you are like that all the time, 
that transmit tiredness. If you're like that, it transmits security and health. So this is also important which position you have in your body. If you sit because you have pain or whatever, that is another, uh, another very important thing. If you sit, you shall never do like that because this is a, this is a, a message of, a, how can I say, a worldliness, or a message of a, a, a kind of a tiredness and a boring a condition, you know. If you're in the, the normal position of sitting is like that, if you close your legs like that, it's a message of lack of confidence, fear. And uh, <clears throat> the best thing is if you sit in the front of public, that you sit in the movements. Because this, this gives you more curiosity of, of, the, of the message that you, that, you trans that, that you transmit. But I told you that sitting in the front of the people it's not usual, that is only if let's say you have a minister, you have the, the, the master of ceremony, and then if the master of ceremony speaks, then you have to sit. Then when you sit, you sit properly. You never put your legs one upon the other because that is uh, lack of respect. It's uh, like uh, uh, kind of informal way of expression. And we are formally dressed, we have a formal message, we are like ambassadors of heaven, and ambassadors always behave very seriously, very gentle, and very polite. And that's the way we are supposed to transmit the message. We're not supposed to hurt the public. The dress it's another important issue. We have a dress code in our church. A minister has to wear it. A coat has to have an official manner, a dress. It doesn't matter if you have a slip or if you have a shirt that doesn't need the slip, but you need to be dressed officially. The testimony speaks very clearly about that. We need to be dressed in a way as we, the most official way as possible because we speak in the front of God, we speak about God, and we cannot be dressed just the way we, we want to or dress like a carpenter. We cannot be dressed like a tax driver. We need to be dressed like ambassador of Christ. And this is very important when you transmit the message in this way that brings a more ser serious input to it. There are Protestant churches in which the minister is dressed very common way. They're dressed with the blue jeans and with their, you know, cowboy shirts and things like that, which is the, their theory that if Jesus will come today, he will be dressed with a common dress. This is appealing more to the sinful people, to the another uh, kind of public. But that's not the truth. We know that Jesus was dressed with a very special garment. The garment was very expensive. This is why the thieves, no, the, the soldiers, when they crucify him, they cast a lot for this garment. The garment was very special. So he was not just uh, dressed in a, in a way as everybody else. He had a very unique dress. It says that this, his dress was, was not done by pieces, by this, that this uh, uh, I don't know the word, was stitched, was stitched as, a, as one whole 
That's why they couldn't depart in pieces. They have to take it or leave it. Only one person could have it. And that is uh, that's something very special, very special way of preparing dresses. Unusual for Israel at that time. About what? About the dresses. The testimony. I can show you that. Anyway, in preaching, we need to be officially dressed, clean. If you have something to put in order, you hear, you have to put them in order. If you have a beard, you have to be put in order. You have to be shaved, you have to be clean. You have to have an impression of a person that's really uh, pay attention to that what you're doing and respect the office you have. Our expressions have to be adopted to the culture and to the body language we want to transmit and which the people understand. Our movements have to be also adequate to the message and not exaggerated and also not too little. The position of the body have to show respect and to the pulpit, to the Bible, and also to the things we are talking about. Now we come to the next uh, section of our study, and that is the title of the sermon. We are coming to the section of how to prepare a sermon. Number one, if you remember, we study how the speaker has to be prepared. He has to be humble, he has to be a man of prayer, and he has to be a man of the book. Then we talk about the public. We need to investigate, to analyze the public. And then we talk about our voice. And now we talk about our external expressions when we are speaking. Now we are coming to a new section, which is the sermon. How to prepare the text of the sermon. It's 10 o'clock. I don't know, we have another class. Let's begin with that because we have very little time. Now, the first things when we begin a ceremony is to select a title. In our church, unfortunately, we don't pay much attention to a title. And this is because our way of doing sermons and preaching is not very similar as this what the Protestant churches are doing. And I must tell you that's unfortunately because what the Protestant churches are doing, they're preparing titles of their sermons and they publish these titles of sermons outside of the church. There in the church. I talk already with the brethren and say, please, brethren, let's prepare ourselves and let's put the title of the sermon there in the street where so many cars passing by. That will appeal to the people. If they see a sermon interesting, they'll say, I want to know about this issue. I haven't I haven't heard of something about that. That is a kind of part of uh, missionary work, the practice the people. But we, we, we could not, I don't know why, but we could not organize that. And I haven't seen that in any of our churches to be done. Maybe in Blue Street in Canada you publish the title of sermon. Do you do that on the street? No? No. <clears throat> because I remember you have a, a, a son. Yeah? So <clears throat> So the, the Protestant churches are doing that and they are appealing to the title of their sermons 
and people are joining their churches because they get attracted by one and another subject. And we're not doing that, and that is unfortunate. We need to understand that a sermon has to have a title. Even if it is a textual sermon, we're going to see different types of sermons. And some of the sermons are based on the Bible verse. No matter, we need to have a title. The title has to be attractive, has to be short and easy to remember. If we speak about Christ, you cannot just say, title of sermon, Jesus Christ. People will say, okay, Jesus Christ, that you read all the Bible is about it. Nothing, nothing about that. But uh, if, you, if, you, if you say, let's say, how Jesus Christ was tempted, oh, that's already something appealing. Or the pain of Jesus Christ. How Jesus Christ saved you. The title can, can have also the sense of a question. Who is going to save you? Let's say. Very simple question. What is going to happen with the world. Will the end of the when is the end of the world coming? Short to the point, a short title, easy to remember, attractive question mark, taking the attention, raising up the curiosity of the people. And at the same time the title should respond or should be honest. Not that you say, come on, we're going to teach about health, and people come, and then you teach them about the Sabbath. They will say, come on, that was a lie. They're cheating here, you know. They <laughs> are trying to get us here. And that's happened sometimes in Europe because they, they don't like religious things. If they see a religious title, hardly somebody will come. So they try to attract the people with the health lectures. So the title has to be attractive, has to be short, has to be easy to remember. And the next point is the composition of our sermon. Pay attention, brethren, because that is also a lot of lack of knowledge in many places I have been. The people are speaking and speaking and speaking and speaking and you finally you don't know what these people are talking about so we need to have a composition in our speech and this composition in the beginning I really recommend you that you have a, a kind of sheet of paper and you write down title of the sermon the Bible verse if you have a Bible verse if it is the subject, which is the subject of research you're doing, then you write introduction and you put the point of the introduction you have. Then you have the exposition and you put the point you want to put in the exposition. And then you have a closing of the ceremony and you put in the closing what kind of thing you're going to do. That will help you to have a structure in your speech and not just fly away here and there and then finally you don't know where do you end. We will spend more time now in studying what is the introduction, what is the exposition, what is the closing of the ceremony and God willing we will need to to reach to the point that we do some experience also. I'm sure you have done that already. You do your morning, evening worship. It's <clears throat> now, when we talk about introduction, 
we need to understand that the first three minutes of our ceremony are very decisive. Why the first three minutes? Because the first three minutes is when the people have the question, what is this man going to talk about? Who is this preacher? Is he a good preacher? Is he a practice preacher? People are curious. In the first three minutes, this curiosity has to be satisfied. We need to give answer all their questions. We need to capture the attention through the introduction. We need to tell them what is the central point of our ceremony. We need to use thesis, antithesis, and synthesis in order to raise up the curiosity until the highest grade. Now, how do we capture the attention of the people? We use there are many methods, different ways of expressions, different ways of doing it. I think Brother Yell will present his version also. He's planning to give you a lecture in about how to do sermon. I think he will use two hours on that. So you can know his style of, of doing it. And he's doing very well. You can capture the attention with a, a help of illustration or a story that has happened and something uh, personal experience straight from the beginning you can capture their attention by presenting a thesis and antithesis what is that? this is Presenting the apparently contradiction. Let's say you're preaching about the 144,000. The thesis is the 144,000 is a literal number. The antithesis is that the 144,000 is a symbolic number. In the introduction, you can bring the problem. What is the problem? What is the 144,000? Some people say it is symbolic. Some people say it is literal. What is the 144,000 then? It's literal or is it symbolic? You don't need to tell a big story. You don't need to make much illustration. You put the thesis and antithesis and the attention of the people is already there. They know what is the issue about. And they are in expectation of hearing the synthesis or what is the conclusion finally. The motivation is there. The interest is there. You can use a personal experience but you will never, you should never move out of the central point. Sometimes people use stories and the stories are not related to the central point, but the story began to be a central point, which is a mistake that we can do. A short example. <clears throat> One time a brother came to preach and he began to tell us how he make a trip. And he make a trip and he went to this place and then he went to other place. And he used the Bible also and how this have happened and what kind of experience they had and how they were short in gasoline and the Lord helped them. And, and then he make relations with the trips of the apostles and this and that. Very unusual way of uh, preaching. And people were attentive, but the message was not there. 
because the central point was not Jesus Christ, the central point was their trip. Easily, <coughs> the central point of the ceremony can be concentrated to the speaker. And that's another mistake that we can do. How did that happen? That happened when I begin to use the word I. And be very careful of using that when you preach. Let's say the preacher begin to speak and say, when I was young and that's happened to me, and I did that, and I did that, and then this happened to me, and other things happened to me. Of course, the ceremony, the, 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 the experience, is supposed to show the miracle that Jesus do in my life. But we are not in the youth hour of experiences. We are in ceremony time. And when we do ceremony, we are supposed to put the central point in Jesus Christ, not in ourselves. In one of these situations, Apostle Paul was in a perplexed condition because he had to tell his own experience. But he didn't want to use the word I because if, you, you, if he used the word I, then he will speak about himself. Then what did he do? He say, I know a man. I don't know. He was taken to the third heaven. And he saw things incredible. He speaks about himself, but he don't speak about himself. Because he here to put the word I. I was the man that was taken to the third heaven. I was the man that the angels appeared to me. I was the man that Jesus appeared to me. In one occasion, he do that when he ex explained that to the king Agrippa. But when he writes his letter, he doesn't speak about himself in personal, in personal form. He used a hyperbolic way of expression. And that's very important, brothers. When we go to introduction, we're not supposed to put I there. We have to put always the central point in Jesus Christ. You understood the thesis and the antithesis, how that could go in the introduction? That's very important. If we have, I give you an example of the 144,000. If we speak about Jesus Christ, we can speak about Jesus Christ and we can say thesis, antithesis. Some people believe Jesus Christ come in a body, a human body, you know, of Adam before the coming of sin. And some other believe he comes in the, in the body of, of man after the sin. Thesis, antithesis. We go about faith. Some people believe that we become the righteousness by faith. Some others say we become it by works. You can read the one Bible verse and you can read James that says not only by faith but by the works you are justified. So thesis, antithesis. It's very important in the introduction that you put already the uh, the most concentrated things out of your sermon, that you uh, get as much as possible the curiosity or raise up the curiosity and capture the attention of the people. Not necessary to use always a stories for that, but you can use also a story. If you use the story, don't forget the central point that's supposed to be Christ, love of Christ, or the spiritual point of your service. The synthesis is actually the, the result. Thesis and antithesis, the synthesis is what you come out during the <coughs> during your exposition, during your uh, the rest of the service.
the exposition is the second part of our ceremony. That is the, the main body of the ceremony. Coming back to introduction, we need to understand introduction has to be short. Introduction cannot be more than five minutes. If you have 45 minutes of ceremony, introduction has to be very concentrated. You get the most important thing in the introduction, get the attention of the people. And then introduce to the exposition. Now, when we go to the exposition, one of the most important part in exposing things is the exegesis of the Bible scripture. We need to explain the, the Bible thing. You cannot make a sermon without explaining. Otherwise, the sermon has no any sense. The sermon is not a theological or philosophical uh, study. The sermon is a sermon. And the sermon has to do with explaining the Bible. You need to understand that. The sermon does not explain Hegel, does not explain uh, can the different philosoph philosophical writers, even if they write about the Bible because they are idealistic philosophers. The sermon does not explain Einstein and his physical stuff, although he was a religious man and he writes things about the Bible. The sermon does not explain the life of Isaac Newton, Although Isaac Newton has written a lot about the Bible interpretation, the ceremony speaks about the Bible, the Bible, the Bible, and the Bible alone. Even if we use the testimony of Sister White, they have to support a Bible-based speech. We're going to see in the styles of the, of the ceremonies. We have different styles. I'm <coughs> presenting you especially two of them. One of them is the textual, textual ceremony. Textual ceremony, we will see it's taking a Bible verse as a foundation, divides the Bible verse in portions, and explains first part, second part, third part, Another ceremony is the thematic ceremony. Then we have a subject like love, hope, faith, righteousness, and then we get all the Bible verses supporting this subject. We can use a concordance and make a research. And then we gradually developed the subject. In both ways, we need to have an exegetic of the Bible scriptures. We need to explain the Bible truth. We need to explain the context of the verses. We need to explain historical context. By the exegetic or by the exposition, we need to have a strong central point. In both classes of sermons, the textual or the other one that has to do with the subject, we can easily lose a central point or a line if we're jumping here and there to different verses that speaks about different subjects. 
Once we explain the Bible verse and we have a central point, we need to find out what kind of argumentation, what kind of support we're going to use. <clears throat> we can use argumentation, logical argumentation. We can lose examples from our lives and you can use experiences illustrations we can use contracts and exaggerations in order to make it clear what that means some examples let's say the central point of my sermon is 144,000 I have to and I have raised up the thesis, antithesis in the introduction, saying what is that about 144,000? Is literal or is symbolic? Then come the exposition. I have to read the Bible verses related to 144,000. I open Revelation chapter 7 and I read about the 144,000. Then the people are expecting argumentation now to give the answer to give the conclusion what is that is literal or is this symbolic then I have to analyze the text the text says that 144,000 is as a result of the ceiling and this is a result of the number 12 times the, the 12,000 of the tribes of Israel then I need to explain that the tribe of Israel are not literal, but it's symbolic. Because they want the tribe of Israel are not really the tribe of Israel, but this is the, the already the spiritual Israel. Then raise up automatically the question, <coughs> if the tribes of Israel are, have a spiritual meaning, why shall the number 144,000 have a literal meaning? Then what I'm going to do? I have to <coughs> explain by comparing other texts. I need to use the prophecy of 2,300 evening and morning. Evening and morning, so days, it's not literal, it's symbolic, it's prophetic. It's one day means one year. But 2,300, the number, stays the same, right? Same thing is with the 70 weeks. Same things is with any other prophecy. The number never changed. Then I have to compare the number with other numbers where God reveals the number of the people of God. The people of God have been numbered many times. Let's say Elijah <coughs> was in prayer and say, I am alone here. And then the Lord tells him, no, you're not. How many are left? Remember? 7,000. Is that symbolic or it's literal? Literal. Always when God numbers his people, he doesn't speak about literal. He, he, he doesn't speak about symbolic, about literal. So you need to put an argumentation, a few points. You need to explain it. Then you need to, to put proofs about the, the things. Then you need to use illustration and personal experiences. In 144,000, you cannot use personal experiences, but when you talk about faith, when you talk about prayer, when you talk about hope, when you talk about the interfere of Jesus Christ in your life, you can use a lot of personal experiences. But when we use the personal experiences, we always need to understand that we shall never <coughs> depart or separate from the central point, which is Jesus Christ. To use contrast and exaggerations. That is what Apostle Paul used a lot in his letters. The letters of Romans, he used contrast and exaggerations. What kind of contrast and exaggerations he used? Let's try to remember. 
cup of salad. Wrong. You remember? He says, The law is good, but I am slave, I am weak. In chapter 6, he says, We die for the sin. He said, Literally, we die. No, we don't die literally, we die spiritually for the sin. Then he says we die but we resurrect the same way as Christ resurrect. It's not true, we don't resurrect, we're still the same, but symbolically, in contrast to the sin, when we accept Christ, we like to resurrect to a new life. So these are exaggerations and contrasts which he uses. Also he uses a hyperbolic language, he speaks the sin to the sin like a kingdom, you have a principle, it's a law, and the law of sin, and he presents sin like a, a person that enslaves you, like, you know, like a powerful person. And these are hyperbolical expressions helping to a uh, to explain and to illustrate your speech. Let's close here and have a break. I think we have another study. I wonder why the brothers are not here. Let's have a prayer. Sharon.